The Brain and Mind Institute is focused on two major pillars, uh, two major domains of activity. One is focused on mental health and the other one uh, on neuroscience. And in essence, we're uh, looking to have a broader connection uh, through the brain of the mental health and neuroscience domains. Um, so the uh, moving forward from uh, our last week, it was the Brain Awareness Week and the Brain Awareness Month. We're very happy to be focusing on the neuroscience domain. And uh, we're happy to be launching our new series in, uh, on neuroscience and uh, we have in this is the inaugural lecture. So uh, I will have Dr. Oliveria uh, Nensik Taylor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Krakauer, uh, in a minute. But before I do that, I just wanted to say um, to say a huge thank you uh, to all the panelists and the speakers, as well as all the participants that are joining us online from many different countries. So um, in this uh, neuroscience series, um, as I said, this is an inaugural series. And so we're particularly proud and happy to have Dr. Krakauer join us. And so without further ado, I will have Dr. Olivera Nensek taylor introduce the keynote speaker. Olivera, over to you. Thank you very much, Zul. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Olivera Nasik taylor I'm a neuroscience consultant at the Brain and Mind Institute. And it's my truly great pleasure and privilege to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. John Krakauer. Dr. Krakauer is currently John Malone Professor Endowed Chair, Professor of Neurology and Neuroscience all these positions at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. He's in Baltimore in Maryland. He's also a visiting scholar uh, at the Champollion Center for the Unknown in Lisbon, Portugal, and visiting scholar at Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute, Institute in Columbia, New York, and also an external professor in Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Before joining, the, uh, before joining Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Cracker was on the faculty of, at Columbia University, where he also completed his MD degree and neurology residency. Dr. Cracker received his bachelor's and master's degree from Cambridge University. Of course, it will take me much longer to list all his research accomplishments, books, commentaries, invited reviews, publications, and so on. He has more than 74 peer-reviewed publications, <clears throat> 14 book chapters, an exceptionally well-received book he published with Thomas Carmichael in 2017 entitled Broken Movement, the Neurology of Motor Recovery After Stroke. Uh, I really warmly recommend it, uh, and if you go to uh, the Amazon website, you will find that this book received five stars. Uh, how often do you see that on Amazon? Not uh, Dr. Karma Krakauer uh, work was also featured and profiled in numerous media outlets, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, the Washington Post, or National Geographic, and many others. Uh, regrettably, I will not have sufficient time to introduce Dr. Krakauer's extensive educational and mentoring activities, but we may have time to talk about uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, I'm hoping. Dr. Krakauer's well-funded research is primarily focused on stroke, with a particular focus on how motor learning occurs in the brain and how such learning is promoted by using virtual reality or digital therapeutics. Thanks to him, we all now need to learn that phrase that may change the future of neuro recovery that is digital therapeutics or digital medicine. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to underscore that Dr. Krakauer is not only uh, a scientist or neuroscientist extraordinaire, but he is also an entrepreneur at the forefront of virtual recovery research. Dr. Krakauer is a co-founder of the company M Square Health and of the creative engineering Hopkins-based project named Kata. I hope I pronounced that correctly, John. You correct me, please. You did, you did, you did, yes. Uh, he's also a chief medical and scientific advisor to MindMaze, a company developing tele-rehabilitation and digital therapeutics for neurologic conditions. So let me conclude this brief introduction by saying that Dr. Krakow is not afraid to challenge conventional scientific or medical approaches or thinking when it comes to the brain and its ailment, and that's why we invited him here. With that, I will hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Krakower. Dr. Wow, Krakower. thank you. I don't think I've had an introduction like that ever. Thank you very much. How am you I going to do that? <laughs> All right, I shall try now. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, well, it's um, a pleasure to be here. And one day I hope I can actually, in person, visit one of these marvelous campuses. And uh, it's very exciting to hear about your new institute. Um, fantastic. Okay, well, I'm going to talk to you about um, a, a line of work that I've been involved in for well over a decade, um, as alluded to, um, really talking about the challenges in the biology of recovery after brain injury, but in particular stroke. But I hope that the principles are more general. I mean, I'm sure they um, are overlapping with spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and even degenerative diseases. Um, LAM is our lab at Hopkins, the Brain Learning Animation Movement Lab. This calligraphic Japanese dolphin is the Kata logo, and then that's Johns Hopkins. Um, this is our website. You can go to the BLAM website, and uh, this is the book um, that we wrote, Tom Carmichael and I, back in 2017, which really covers in more detail a lot that I'll talk about today, although, of course, things have changed in the last uh, five years. It's horrific how quickly time goes by. Um, all right. So here I'm just going to talk about some of the stuff that's really you know, puzzled me for ages as a stroke neurologist and as a neuroscientist. Um, and, you know, I always think it's nice to be able to give a talk where you can simply indulge your puzzlement with others. <laughs> so that's what's going to happen today. Um, so hemiparesis after stroke, it's, you know, it's been of great interest going back centuries. But, you know, at the end of the 19th century, there was sort of an awareness that cortical disease could lead to two sets of symptoms sort of the negative ones um, where there was loss of control and positive ones where, as Hunings Jackson, the neurologist, posited, sort of could intrude because they lost control from higher centers. And then the neurologist FMRR Walsh talked about this dual nature of hemiplegia, this combination of loss of voluntary movement and the intrusion of positive phenomena, spasticity and synergy. So in a sense, those of us who look after stroke patients have to be two types of neurologists at the same time. We're having to deal with sort of loss of function and then the intrusion of unwanted movements. In other words, stroke is really a movement disorder as well as a deficit disorder. And I think a lot of neurologists forget that, that it's really that double type of neurological condition. So let's talk about some of these. So the positive symptoms, these resting postural abnormalities and synergies. You know, everyone's seen, you know, a patient, you know, a typical chronic stroke patient with this abnormal clock posture, the depressed protracted shoulder, the internally rotated arm, the flexed forearm, um, and the flexed wrist, so this sort of flexor posture. Okay, and then of course, if you don't treat that, then it begins to turn into peripheral abnormalities like you know, tendon shortening, joint contracture, atrophy, um, and it can be very difficult to treat at that point. Um, now, there was a time when papers had more patients than authors and actually were natural history studies. It's difficult to do these today. But this was a classic one um, by Thomas Twitchell, published in 1951, 
um, who died fairly recently, in fact, he died the year the book came out, um, who basically wanted to characterize the progression of recovery in patients with stroke and hemiparesis. And he came up with this recovery sequence. In other words, at first, zero could be considered plegic. You can't move at all. And then you begin to get some flexion at the shoulder, then some flexion at the elbow, then some wrist and finger flexion. So that's the sort of flexor posture that we were talking about. But remember, this is voluntary movement. So these are synergies. And synergies, <coughs> just to remind everyone, are voluntary movements where you get unwanted co-contraction across joints. In other words, when you try and flex at the elbow, you get flexion at the shoulder and at the wrist, and that's what we're seeing here. And then you also can develop an extensor synergy. So in other words, now, in fact, you get extension across the joints instead of flexion. And if you're lucky and get through this sequence, you can begin to do out of synergy movements, um, and then maybe even finger individuation. So in other words, patients would go along this fairly stereotypical sequence. I mean, there's lots of variability and then the key was how far through could you get? And then the goal of rehabilitation would be to try and push you and to prevent you from getting stuck somewhere in the middle of the sequence. Okay, oops. So we've talked about the abnormal posture. We've talked about the unwanted synergies during voluntary movement. Now we'll talk about the negative symptoms, uh, the loss of motor control. Okay, so this is where you lose dexterity and strength. You can study dexterity of the arm and hand in various ways. This is a way to try and isolate dexterity of the upper limb. Um, you can do that by having people sit at a table like this where the arm is supported. There's an air sled so that friction is largely removed. And then their shoulders are tight against the back of the chair so that they can't move their trunk to compensate. So what you're really doing here is looking at motor control dexterity of the shoulder and elbow. The word dexterity is often reserved for the hand. That's a mistake. You have to be as dexterous with your upper limb as you do your hand. And this is basically the dexterity stress test for the upper limb with the removal of weakness, friction, and compensation. Um, and the nice thing about making planar movements like this is that there's only one solution in Cartesian space for the endpoint. So to make a straight movement of the kind that you can see on the right, you have to coordinate unique joint angles at the shoulder and elbow. Um, and if you can't do that, you'll get wobbly, variable, inaccurate paths, which I'll show you now. So that's a healthy subject on the left. This is very good control of the arm and shoulder. And then here on the right, you see a patient with stroke. Okay. So obviously what you want is to somehow get from the right to the left, right? You want that dexterity to improve. Now, this abnormality in curvature and a variability of that you see on the right can be captured mathematically by a simple scalar number using a hierarchical principles component analysis approach. Um, all you need to know is there's a way to sort of go from just your visualization of the difference between the left and right to a number that can tell you the distance between being normal on the left and being abnormal on the right. Okay, a simple scalar. And you can plot that on the y-axis against time. Um, and the, the higher the number, the worse you are. This is initially after stroke. Then you have this improvement. And then you plateau. Now, this isn't due to the sensitivity of the measure because you can see down here on this dotted line, this is what the unaffected side or healthy subjects look like. So there's a massive amount of space here of, that you could potentially improve into and you don't. All right, so this is somewhat disturbing that the recovery process is sort of over around five weeks um, in patients. And as I will argue, this spontaneous recovery is something that is not impinged upon by current rehabilitation. So now I'm going to talk about this dissociation of the movement disorder from the motor control disorder, this double problem that stroke presents us with. So you can do an experiment where you can take a patient and you can have them you know, hold a manipulandum, and then you can passively with a robot move them to various parts of space and you just tell them to relax. 
In other words, there's no voluntary movement here. We're just trying to probe the space and see if they can relax wherever they get placed. All right. And what you can see is that there, and this is what by a, a postdoc in the lab at Hopkins, Alcas Hajosa, who's shown rather beautifully that there are these abnormal resting forces. These are basically the quantification of that abnormal posture that you saw in that picture that I showed you of a classic patient. And you can see that in a paretic side, there are these forces, these flexor forces pushing you towards your body. Um, and what's interesting is that if you, and this is the unaffected side, but look at this very big change in these abnormalities if you give weight support. In other words, if the arm is not required to generate strength to hold up its own weight, these resting forces switch off. They're still present, but they're smaller. Okay. So somehow, this supporting the weight of the arm reduces the intrusion of these flexor postural forces to some degree. This is the postural equivalent to work that Jules DeWald in Chicago has done showing that you can get better extension at the elbow and less intrusion of the flexor synergy if you provide weight support. We can talk about the biology of that um, at some point. It's complex. And what's interesting is that if you, and you know, we don't have to go into detail here, detail here but if you try and correlate movement-related abnormalities to resting abnormalities. In other words, you take a measure of these at-rest abnormalities and you say, well, what's the relationship between these at-rest abnormalities with abnormalities when you're trying to actually move? And surprisingly, they're independent of each other. Okay, and this is just one measure of, on the y-axis, um, the direction of the postural force against the errors you make during movement. Now, this is important. It is not only biologically fascinating that we may have separate systems in the brain for the control of posture and the control of movement for the upper limb, but a lot of rehabilitation in the 20th century was predicated on the idea that if you treated the resting abnormalities, you'd get a voluntary movement abnormality um, benefit automatically. Okay, so passive movements, telling people about their posture, somehow thinking that that would generalize to improvements in voluntary movement, and that is not true. Spasticity is a very similar notion. Uh, a lot of workers, patients are given Botox for spasticity and abnormality at rest, but there's no evidence of any kind that spasticity has an impact on voluntary movement. Okay, so this form of dissection is not just motor neuroscience. It's actually extremely important when you think about coming up with treatments for the various components for the heretic upper limb. This is actually the study that I told you by Jules DeWald. So in other words, what he showed was that, you know, if you don't have any weight support and you try and sweep your arm out with the extension of the elbow, you end up crunched down here. You can't move at all. You're flexed. But the more and more weight support you give, the larger the area you can sweep out with your arm and your elbow begins to escape the flexor synergies and can extend itself. Very interesting, right? Varying degrees of weight support, which is at right angles to the forces needed to generate at the elbow. So it's not assisting in any way to get weight support around the elbow. And yet you massively increase the area available to the arm. Okay. Now, what are these synergies? Well, um, with Stuart Baker, a very prominent motor physiologist, primate physiologist in England, in Newcastle, we got a grant from the NIH in the US to try and see where these synergies are coming from, it's very important to be aware that most animal models don't have them. So in other words, the most, the prominent movement disorder in humans was absent from the animal models, which basically showed the negative symptoms. Right now, it's a very long discussion as to why there's this dissociation between negative and positive symptoms in the animal models and their co-presence in humans. So this is just showing you the beginning of experiments they're doing in a primate model, where instead of doing the classic pyramidal tract lesion that most monkey models were about in the mid 20th century to try and mimic hemiparesis, we're actually probing lesions um, in the premotor and motor cortex. Okay. In particular, a region between the dorsal premotor cortex and the motor cortex, which was called a suppressor region by Denny Brown, a neurologist 
in Boston, who actually, it's a small world, was a mentor for Twitchell um, to see whether there were areas that could switch off these unwanted synergies. Now, this is just preliminary data. This is the monkey you can see from above. They're trying to move a handle here. So this is its head. I hope you can see this. This is a bird's eye view of the monkey. And then this is the monkey making reaching movements for the stroke in that region and then recovering. Now, you'll notice that really the animal compared to a human is doing really well. This was part of the mystery. Right? This is, you're not seeing these abnormalities to the same degree, even in a monkey model. But if you look carefully at the EMG, you see that over time, there is an increase of flexion in the EMG that creeps up over time. And there's no need for it, right? The movement's are already looking quite good. So there's this unwanted intrusion, but there's also an increase in extensor EMG. So in other words, even though you can see this going on at the level of the EMG, you don't see it in the kinematics because unlike in humans, there seems to be a counter force. And we know we've posited that this might be the, the greater potency of the rubrospinal tract in non-human primates compared to humans. Okay, but this is very preliminary, but as you can see, we're on the hunt for the biology of the positive symptoms, whereas the pyramidal tract lesions in classical monkey models were only able to elicit negative symptoms. I know this is all a bit involved. Um, we can always take questions later. Um, now, continuing the sort of uncoupling the separate biology of these positive symptom and negative symptoms. This is also by Alcus had Joseph looking at, you know, people making those planar reaching movements I described to you. And these are controls. Um, these are patients with chronic stroke and these are their Fugelmeier scores. Now the Fugelmeier score, which was devised in the 1970s, which is the primary impairment measure for the ICF, um, was actually devised as a number to capture the sequence that Twitchell and then Brunstrom further described. So there's a historical irony that the impairment measure of record, the Fugelmeier score, was devised to capture the positive symptoms, the synergies that were described by Twitchell and Brunstrom. Right? But you know, as Santayana said, those who know no history are doomed to repeat it. Right? And so anyway. Here we're seeing that the fugal mass should not be used as a universal impairment measure because what you're seeing here is, I'll show you now, there's a very interesting dissociation between that measure of synergies and dexterity of the arm. So if you can see here, these are patients who are six months or more out with stroke and here are their fugal mass scores. The higher the score, the better, right? So these are quite low, these are milder. But you can match the fugal mass scores and this patient has a a fugal my score than this, but their kinematic dexterity is worse. And true across the board, you can match the positive symptom and have worse dexterity. So here's a very nice demonstration that these component deficits of hemiparesis are dissociable. And here you can see it in tabular form. Okay. Um, that you know the fugal my is matched, and yet the kinematic dexterity is hugely different here. Okay. So again, just so you don't lose sight because of all the detail, what we're talking about here is the need to see the paretic upper limb. Calling it paretic is just a blanket term for all the dissociable component underlying mechanisms that one has to try and dissect out. Now, basically, if this is a summary slide, um, of what we know at the current time about these components that I'm discussing in animal models. So in the mouse, and what this ruler means is, is there a way to measure the deficit? And here is there a way to fix it? <laughs> um, and so in the mouse, we know that they get a motor control deficit and we can actually do things for the motor control deficit in the mouse. We know they get weak. Synergies have not been shown convincingly in, in rodent models. And we also know they can find compensatory ways to improve. In the monkey, again, you can show loss of motor control, you can show loss of strength. Synergies have been a challenge, hence that monkey model we're trying to develop with Stuart Baker in England. And compensation has been shown. In humans, 
we know there's loss of motor control, we know there's loss of strength, we know there are synergies, and we know there's compensation. What we don't know is whether either the negative symptoms, motor control, or the positive symptoms, synergies can be treated. Whereas in the monkey and the mouse, the negative symptoms can respond to intense behavioral intervention. Okay, so I think it's very useful to take a bird's eye view of what we've seen in these animal models and in humans, see where the gaps are, and then ask ourselves, you know, what are we going to do about those gaps? So here, um, I'm going to show you some interesting studies in the rodent that I did with a mentee of mine, Steve Zeiler. He had a K award with me, and then he's now an associate professor at, at Hopkins. And here we were trying to look at this interesting notion that it depends when you are after stroke, that how much you'll respond to an intervention. So, you know, there's a lot, and I write about the book in the book, you know, how legitimate is it to study the mouse or the rat to learn about stroke in humans? And, you know, it turns out that there's quite interesting homology in reaching movements in, for example, the rat and the human. Uh, this is figures from Kolb and Weishaw, Canadian uh, scientists who've done lots of classic work in, in, in rodent models of cortical lesions. Um, anyway, I think there is some sufficient overlap homology, as it's called technically, to justify um, making these comparisons. So this is a mouse reaching for a pellet. I think it's, you know, people who see these videos are quite surprised at how dexterous a mouse can be. Now this is at the beginning, so it's got to be trained to pick up that pellet, put it in its mouth without dropping it, right? That takes up a legitimate amount of training, and as you can see here, because it fails, it tries to use its tongue instead. It has no table manners. Now, what you can do in these mice is you can give them a motor cortical stroke. You can do an endothelin one injection. And here you'll see this small cortical stroke in the motor cortex of the mouth. And then you can see that it will have substantial deficits on that pallet reaching task. This is percent success of being able to reach for about 30 pellets in a sequence without dropping them. In other words, you, you, we're very strict. You have to reach in one smooth movement, pick up the pellet, put it in the mouth. <clears throat> can be no double attempts, can be no dropping, nothing like that. Um, and so it takes a normal mouse here 10 days of training to begin to get to about a plateau level of about 55%. It's difficult. It's a cortical dependent behavior in rodents. Okay, so once you get to that level of performance, it doesn't really get that much higher. Um, you can give a stroke, as I just showed you. Obviously, there's a drop in performance. And then you can train the mouse for, you know, three weeks here of training on the same task that you trained originally here. And you can see that you just can't get back to this level of performance. Very similar to humans, right? They get a loss of dexterity in the arm and hand. They get rehab. Usually the rehab is less intense than rodents get, and you can't get back. Okay, and as you can see here, there was a weak gap between the stroke and the beginning of training. Okay. Now, interestingly, let's not wait this week. Let's just start right away. Back to normal. So in the mouse, in just seven days of training, remember back here, we could get nothing to happen over three weeks of training because we waited this week. Here, we didn't wait a week, and we could get them back to the performance in just seven days. Okay, so fairly dramatic um, demonstration of time window matters. Now, what is it? So here's a very I think cool experiment, right? So you do that again here, you train the mouse and you give it the stroke and then it drops and then you do, you wait this week. So again, you can't get them back because you waited too long, right? But what if we give them another stroke? In other words, what if we treat their stroke with a stroke? Okay, because maybe if you give them a second stroke and then don't wait that week and start right again, like in the previous experiment, you can rescue them from this initial stroke by giving them a second stroke. There's a second stroke. They're going to get worse, you're going to see. Back to normal. So think how strange this is. You couldn't get them to recover from this stroke by waiting a week 
and training them all this time, you then give them another stroke next to their original motor cortical stroke. In other words, it's larger. And look, they definitely suffer from it. But then you don't wait. In other words, you don't wait that gap. You go right away and back. Kind of spooky. Now, obviously, I'm not ever recommending that we treat our patients by giving them second strokes to treat their first stroke, but it proves the principle that there's something special about the environment in the brain after initial injury that creates unique plastic conditions that we need to learn to exploit with behavioral intervention. And it's not just anywhere. So if you do the same experiment and then you give them a second stroke, and this is in the contralateral cortex, and we did it in the occipital cortex, nothing happens. So it's not some non-specific effect of giving an infarct. It has to be in a region uh, that is uh, potentially able to talk to the spinal cord. Um, now, this is a very classic experiment um, done that's very similar. It's a very detailed slide. Um, but it's important because they, this was an equivalent type of experiment done in the primate. And instead of doing the pellets, they were doing a, a well task. And what's very nice is they can show you the proper way of doing it versus the compensatory ways of doing it. And then they took one monkey that was trained intensely early after the lesion. And then another monkey was just allowed to recover on its own. Now, what's important is that pink is normal movement, right? Green and yellow are compensatory movements. What you can see here is that if you train intensely, the compensatory movements start to go away and the pink starts to dominate. Whereas if you don't train, you end up losing all the pink. Some of it appears briefly and you end up with a compensatory movement. Now, the critical point is that while you're training the monkey to go pink, there will be a time where it does worse in terms of number of pellets retrieved. So from a functional performance standpoint, it does worse than a monkey that's allowed to find its own compensatory strategy. But if you stick to it, eventually going pink will make you superior to the plateau of the compensation. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is extremely important for rehabilitation. If you focus on just getting the function, you'll actually hit a local minima. Whereas if you focus on ability and capacity and are more patient, you'll end up better functionally as well. Okay. So critical periods, the type of training matters, true in rodents, true in non-human primates. Okay, so in the book, I basically summarized all the literature with a very simple equation, right? Which is if you want true recovery, if you want to go pink, you have to have a lot of training focused on the pink. You have to have a representation that's latent, residual, that can make the pink behavior. And then you have to have the plasticity levels requisite to respond to the behavior in order to get this representation to do the pink work. Okay, and I'm telling you that this simple behavior explains all the literature that I've seen so far. All right, challenge for you to tell me that it's wrong. Okay, so I've told you all about positive and negative symptoms, their behavioral dissociation. I've told you about critical periods. So what are we going to do about it in humans? Right. So one of the things we know from rodent literature going back 75 years is that what really seems to work for any form of brain injury in, in rodents is this mixture of playful, fun social environments, the exercise, and then training on a skill. So in other words, what you really want for humans is this enriched background, exercise, and training all together. So how do we get A, B, and C together in humans? And for reasons which we can't, we can't really go into today, the entire neurological and rehab profession has failed their patients by not doing any of these in sufficient doses for human patients. In fact, I always tell everyone that if you have a stroke, you'll be, get better treatment as a rat than you will as a human. Now, uh, uh, there's a lot of science on what these enriched environments are. And what is it about these holistic, playful, social, exploratory environments that lead to 
changes throughout the levels, multi-scale changes, right? All the way from neuronal activity, gene expression, all the way up to behavior. Um, and the important point is, is that we know that many things are going on at once, but the key thing is to allow this to be a holistic intervention. In other words, there's a tendency in medicine to try and look for the magic bullet, the single receptor, the single pathway, right? It's not gonna work for nervous system disease. You're gonna to have to have multiplexed holistic interventions. The reason why enrichment has not been tried in humans is that the medical profession doesn't like something that's complex and multifaceted. They want, what's the one pill that I can give? Right? It's been extremely harmful to the neurological profession. Now, another thing you have to do is, okay, if we're going to have an enriched environment for humans, what sort of behavior should they do? Well, it turns out that human beings spend most of their lives in the upper limb in these statistical clouds of everyday life, right? This is where we all live in hand space, whether it's driving, eating with a knife and fork, gesturing during conversations, typing, or using one's iPhone. So in other words, we live in these class, statistical clouds of everyday life. So one of the things we thought was we want to trick people into doing lots and lots of training in these clouds. Okay. This was worked by Daniel Wolpert and his colleagues going back a number of years now. So what would an enriched environment for patients look like? And how would we promote playful, non-task-based exploratory behavior? Right. Now, what I mean by this non-task basis, I don't want, just like in the primate example, right, where if you train them on the outcome, they can actually fall into a local minima in terms of their capacities. So you want to train capacities, not tasks. Now, the whole of rehabilitation is very much fixated on task-oriented therapy. But look what happened to that monkey, right? So we need to find a non-task based exploratory behavior focused on capacities. So a clue for us with animation. So with a very smart team who taught me a lot about the history of animation and gaming, um, in particular, two people who were computer scientists and artists at Johns Hopkins, Omar Ahmad and Pramit Roy, um, they, we tried to say that we would use animation as the way into enrichment in humans. So here's a little pilot study we did with this idea. It was done at Columbia, New York, at Hopkins and at the University of Zurich. It was funded by the James S. McDonald Foundation. And basically what the team, the Carter team designed, led by Omar Ahmad, was they, they built this soft body dynamic dolphin that would, you would steer in the ocean and it would make you make those movements in that statistical cloud of everyday life I told you about. That's me and this is a weight support system so the, all that stuff I told you about weight support, improving dexterity, this is what the idea was here, that in 3D, you could do the weight support to allow dexterity along the line of movement to express itself. So you can see that we borrowed ideas and discoveries from many areas to sort of combine them into this treatment. Okay, this is why I hope you can see that you have to care about all these things in order to optimize and bring them all together. Right, the weight support idea, the, dis the dissociation between synergies, weakness, and dexterity, the need for enrichment, the need for non-task based exploration, the need for high intensity, high dose in the critical time window. All those things converged into this study. Okay. It, it was actually written up last year. It was a very small study. It's extremely difficult. In other words, you know, you essentially had to enroll patients within five weeks of their stroke. They had to do an hour of play in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, five days a week, for three weeks. That's an immense amount of training. So here it is. And it's very important to understand that the control, there were two control groups. There was a historical regular care group, and then there was a time-matched therapy. In other words, the therapist did an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, time on task, um, just like they did. So you know, even the regular, con the, even the control group was intensely different from what usually happened. Right. Now this is what it felt like for the patients. And 
no. The goal is to steer and eat the fish. So you get the idea, right? You're basically swimming in an ocean. You don't even see your arm. Your arm is making these movements in those statistical clouds of everyday life. It gets more and more difficult. It's cognitively challenging. It's quite a workout. And you basically played this game an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, five days a week for three weeks. So imagining having two squash lessons a day, five days a week for three weeks. So what did we find? Well, it was extremely interesting. So what you can see here are two measures of outcomes. You have the ARAT, which is really the closest in humans to a reaching pellet task that I talked to you about in the mouse and the monkey. So this is like a negative symptom test. And then the Fugelmeyer, which we've all been talking about, is the synergy measure. And then what you're seeing here is the two high intensity groups compared to the historical regular therapy group. And what we found is if you did an hour in the afternoon, an hour in the, e an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, five days a week of either dolphin or more time with the therapist, you did considerably better, basically double as good on the negative symptoms as regular therapy. But as you can see here, we didn't beat spontaneous recovery for the positive symptoms. Now, this is a small study and it was underpowered, right? Very difficult to do. It was really a proof of principle. Now there's a much bigger study going on right now with patients doing dolphin earlier within a week of stroke, 150 patients being led by Kathy Stenier, Winston Biblow in New Zealand. <clears throat> and so this whole study is now being repeated with higher end and going earlier. And we'll see if this dissociation between negative and positive signs still holds. But it's very important to realize this result, it's very exciting, right, that it, it basically recapitulated the monkey and the rodent experiments that I showed you. And remember, in the monkey and the rodent experiments, the only things that they ever test in those animal models are negative symptoms. But it was the positive symptoms that caused us the problem in the patients. So we dealt with the equivalent motor control disorder, like in the animal models, but we weren't able to beat spontaneous recovery in the positive symptoms. Okay, so I hope you can see how it is a very complex space where we're thinking about these biological dissociations, we're thinking about critical periods, we're thinking about ways to train. But the exciting thing is that out of the, right out of the gate, a brand new game where you're pretending to be a dolphin was as effective and better than regular therapy as high dose regular therapy. Now, my belief is that, it, that if you wanna give high intensity and high dose training, it's much better to do it with technology and gaming the patients enjoy it much more than try and get poor therapists to give that much treatment every day. So I think we're going to be at a tipping point where when you want to actually get repair, restitution, the pink, you're going to have to do it with this kind of gaming. So why has it been so hard? Well, there's a critical period that closes. We have to deal with a deficit disorder and a movement disorder. The synergies are particularly recalcitrant. In chronic patients, because the critical period is closed, it's not clear what, whether training alone will work. Um, in fact, um, I am now involved in a grant we just received with the University of Pittsburgh um, with um, lead investigator Marco Capogrosso, where we are doing cervical stimulation, cervical spinal cord stimulation with implantable electrodes in chronic patients with upper limb stroke. I won't have time to talk about that today, but it may well be that when the critical period closes in chronic patients, we're gonna to have to basically find additional um, ways with, for example, stimulation to accompany the high dose training to get the equivalent effect as you do early. So this is the point here. Therefore, in the chronic stage, we need an additional intervention in addition to high dose and high density behavioral training, stem cells, neurostimulation or drugs, and this is what we're trying here. Um, these are all the collaborators. As you can imagine, this is an enormous amount of work across monkeys and across mice and across humans. Um, 
the trial was conducted with Andy Luft in Zurich, Tomoka Katago at Columbia, Pablo Selnick at Hopkins, the um, Jorn Diedrichsen was also involved, who's in Canada. These are all the funders, these are all the additional people. And then the final thing I'd like to say is if you're going to do human enrichment and do high dose, high intensity training, then you're gonna need a team of engineers. You're gonna need artists. You're gonna need an additional set of experts in the hospital and medical school environment. And so this is the Carter team. This is a gaming studio that I developed right next door to my lab. It was led by Omar Ahmad, uh, Pramit Roy, and Jero is the artist. And I think we, what we have to learn is that we're gonna do really good human neuroscience, then we're gonna to have to have these kinds of spectacularly brilliant nerds um, who work right beside the clinicians and the neuroscientists. And the dolphin game would simply not exist without this team here. Um, and I'll stop there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Krakauer, for a, a very clinically relevant and, e and exciting um, talk. And I was monitoring a Q and A um, rubric. I didn't see that, but I can see Zul has uh, his hand hand up. So, Zul, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say it's a brilliant presentation. Very important for us to kind of move the field forward, and it's very difficult. But um, I was wondering in terms of the interventions that you were suggesting other than social enrichment as a, as a backgrounder, um, in terms of stimulation, has the repeated transcranial magnetic stimulation been tried in stroke patients? Yes, I mean, there's been many, many studies of TMS and TDCS in stroke patients, both motor and aphasia. Um, for aphasia, it's, it's, a, it's kind of intriguing that, that there may be an additional effect of these brain stimulation approaches on recovery of aphasia. For motor, it's been largely a failure. Um, it's it's uh, not really worked. In other words, it, it's, 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 and you know, that I never really expected it to work. Um, and there's a lot that could be said as to why, but at the current time, uh, TMS and TTCS for stroke recovery have been the dogs that did not bark. Now, it's true that there hasn't been an enormous amount of early interventions using those approaches. So it could yeah. be that if you did it really early, that you yeah. might see something. And then the new kid on the block now is something called vagal nerve stimulation, VNS, um, where a recent trial was published um, suggesting uh, an effect um, in patients of about five, five to four points on the fugal mile in a set of patients. So, you know, it may well be that with proper stratification, proper timing, proper combination with behavioral interventions, that we may find a sweet spot for some of these, you know, invasive and non-invasive interventions. You know, I'm not super convinced about TMS and TDCS. Um, VNS, I'm, I'd like to see more. Um, invasive approaches like what we're doing in the cervical cord, I think, has more promise. Um, but all of this is still to be done. The main point, though, is that if you're going to do everything from TMS to TDCS to VNS to intracranial to spinal cord, is you have to do it against a proper behavioral background. Doing it against regular therapy won't cut it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take an opportunity to actually ask John a, a couple of questions. And one is actually about the enriched environment. Is, are you actually activating the reward circuit? Uh, is the reward circuit activation involved in, in this? And not only, and when I'm talking about the positive effect of the reward circuit, if there is an activation, uh, is it only uh, the effect on motivation or it's actually there is something that activated reward circuit uh, does to the motor recovery uh, yeah, pathways? It's, it's, yeah, it's a very complex question to answer. Um, let me, how do I do this? Okay, one, 
enriched environments have a multiple have multiple effects right let's just make it simple and divide them into two one is that it just may motivate you to spend more time practicing so in other words it just has a time on task effect okay that's one possibility it just makes you do more practice the second possibility is that the as you're in, in sort of implying that being in a motivated state actually increases the gain on training. Mm -hmm. And we've got data to suggest that that is the case. In other words, when you're motivated, you actually both get an improvement in performance and perhaps you're more responsive per trial. Okay. When it comes to talking about reward circuits, I think we have to be extremely careful about sort of saying things like, dopamine is reward and that's the circuit. And in fact, um, we have a paper that I'm hoping is going to be um, accepted soon, uh, a study led by Pablo Selnick and Merritt Branchite, where in fact we show that early after stroke, your reinforcement learning, your reward learning system is actually depressed. Right? So, there's a bit of a paradox there, which would suggest that the, the way in which enriched motivating environments impinge upon spontaneous recovery and training are probably not operating through the classic operant conditioning circuit, mm -hmm. right? So I think the answer to your question is gonna be a kind of a yes and a kind of a no. Oh, the best. I, okay, <laughs> but I have I have to to ask you this. So, did you actually? There must be individual differences in the in the success of the recovery. Have you looked whether the the mental health condition, like say depressed people, would they have a different level of recovery? Yeah, I mean, again, that's sort of like the. The antithesis to yeah, the previous just... question. Yeah, right. In other words, and I think the answer is probably going to be yes, but then of course, is it the patient's depressed and therefore they just partake in less training, they just give up earlier, or is that depressed state going to actually have an effect even when they are partaking in training? We don't have the N um, to really do that kind of subgroup analysis. Um, to the degree that We've found, you know, that reward-based study that I told you about where the reinforcement was depressed, it didn't seem to be related to sort of any depression scale, for example. Mm -hmm. So my guess okay. is it's going to, my guess is it is going to be very important, right, to, but, you know, it's, it, it, it goes in both directions. Most patients can go through a depression after stroke. And so you better create really fun, engaging, lovely environments for them so that they can realize that there's a chance of improving. But what we do is we leave patients alone in rooms and give them a woefully inadequate doses of regular therapy. And then, of course, their depression, in a way, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much time left. I saw one question, Zul, if I may just uh, ask in the Q&A uh, and kind of wrap in uh, also the question I had about the possible role of uh, health centers that are outside, you know, Global North and uh, classical big medical centers in, the, in North America or Europe. Now that you are working with this virtual reality, is there, is there a, a room for patients and experts from uh, the centers outside the global world? Can they contribute? Would you, what would you think would be the advantage of including uh, that population? Well, I mean, there are so many answers to that question. Um, well, one good. is, well, I mean, one is that you know, strictly from a moral standpoint, you, you you can't have all of this just happening in the global north. I mean, that just you almost one doesn't have to even say that, right? Um, two, in terms of creating, you know, this work, this dolphin work is happening in locations, right? They're rooms. It's like a beautiful 
squash court sized space where the lights go down, the music goes up and you're in that environment, right? So it's very important to understand that I believe very strongly that you have to do these in locations. You don't have your surgery done at home. You don't learn how to play tennis at home. You go to locations. It's an event. You go somewhere. All right. So that's the first thing. Now these locations and these systems can be built anywhere. They're not super expensive to create a room like that. You know, maybe twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars. You know, like a fraction of what it costs to buy a CT scanner, right? Um, let alone an MRI scanner. And then I believe the, the deepest point, I think, is I have the belief that it's going to be outside countries like the US. It's going to be in countries outside that European-American axis where you might actually be able to introduce new forms of intervention more easily than the entrenched, encrusted way of doing things that we have in the US or the West. In other words, what I would most like is if countries, other countries actually led the way here because they're not ideologically so bound to the old ways of doing rehabilitation. So there's nothing to stop using this approach anywhere else in the world. My guess is one would probably be more successful. Um, and then you would also add, you know, tracking and forms of tele-rehabilitation to maintain the gains you had in the location. So there's absolutely nothing to stop it being done. And my guess is you probably get better trials and better implementation outside of the US is, is my view. Thank you, and I guess that opens the door for possible collaborations with groups Absolutely. and urologists. I mean, we're, I, mean, we're, I mean, as I said, we're doing trials in Israel, in Portugal, New Zealand, Australia. Um, you know, there's interest in Brazil. In other words, there's nothing to preclude doing it. It just needs to have a person who's really invested in doing it, getting some funding, and going for it. Um, and I'm, I'm serious about that. And it really needs to be done. Good. Um, uh, so, yeah, we'll certainly have an offline conversation about, about the opportunities because we do have a, a stroke center and it's a growing entity uh, and strokes are a common problem. In I mean, I just want to say, you know, just so you understand the, the size of the problem, you know, I don't want to be talking outside of school, but when we did this trial, it was not an NIH funded trial. The NIH then said to me when they saw this dolphin stuff, could you do a, a trial at the NIH in their research hospital? Because they admitted that doing this intensity of treatment within the first four weeks after stroke is almost impossible in the way that current inpatient rehab units are structured. Mm -hmm. Finding that time is almost impossible. We couldn't do it. So in fact, I had to write a trial in New Zealand. So that trial that I mentioned in New Zealand is happening because in New Zealand, it's actually possible to have patients longer in rehab units and then follow them after. So in other words, it's almost impossible to do high intensity, high dose enriched treatments at the current time, early after stroke, either in the acute stroke unit or the acute rehab unit anywhere in the West. And I would like to, to thank you on the behalf of the Brain and Mind Institute and all participants in today's presentation for a most inspiring and enlightening presentation and for allowing us, if you, if, uh, you dare, if I dare say, to, uh, uh, to step into the future. We stepped into the future and not just any future, but an exciting version of, uh, of what lies ahead. So thank Absolutely. you so much. Not at all. My pleasure. To be Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.